Hey everyone and welcome back to part four of this series where we create a fitness tracker with Python. And today part four is all about detecting outliers in sensor data. So the goal for today for this video will be to check whether there are any outliers, extreme values in our data that we want to remove using various methods. All right, so by now you know the drill. Make sure you have watched all the previous videos here in the playlist before continuing with this. And after you've done that, uh, we can continue by downloading the Python file and make sure to put it in your VS Code workspace directory in the features folder that is within the source folder. So source features remove outliers.py. This is the file we will be working in today. All right, then a quick overview of what we will be covering in today's video. We will first briefly discuss what are outliers, extreme values, what do they look like? Then we'll go over box plots and the interquartile uh, inter range to determine outliers. We're going to uh, look at a function that can plot outliers in time. Then we're going to mark outliers using three different methods. So the first one, the IQR method, we're going to look at Chauvinet's criterion and we're going to look at local outlier factor. And then we're also going to check outliers by first grouping on the label. And then eventually we will pick one of the methods that we find uh, suits our problem the best and then we will replace the outliers or remove them uh, better to say and export the new data frame let's get into it all right let's start as usual in vs code by importing all the libraries and it could be that you still have to install sklearn this is a new library that we haven't used before so uh, if this gives you an error use pip install scikit-learn you can do that straight from the interactive session by putting an exclamation mark in front of it and then running this line, or you can do it via the terminal. So open up a terminal and then do pip install scikit-learn. Next, we're going to import the data as usual. So we're gonna start by defining data frame as pd.read, and then we're going to point to our data directory in interim and then select the 01 data process file. Run this line, make sure that the data frame looks like this. And now before we continue, I want to briefly look at what outliers are, what they look like. So we're all on the same page. So coming back to our document over here, there is a resource, what are outliers? And if we have a look at the, this page, there is a brief description. And if we scroll down, we can have a more visual representation of what outliers could potentially look like. But basically to summarize, an outlier is an extreme value in a data set that is much higher or lower than the majority of the values in the data set. So these are just weird, messy values that can introduce noise in our data set. And coming back to our example where we were measuring the movement from a participant doing an exercise, this could, for example, be the case when someone is performing, let's say, a squat, and somewhere mid-movement, um, the participant gets a twitch or something doesn't feel right, and he or she adjusts uh, the position. So he steps back or steps, um, pl places his feet somewhere else, and this could introduce a movement pattern that you typically would not see during a squat. And then the question is, do you want to include this kind of data within your data set? And that is often a pretty hard question to, to answer. So determining whether an extreme value um, is really an outlier and should be removed from a data set always depends on the problem at hand, as with almost everything in data science and machine learning always depends on the problem. But by keeping these extreme values within our data set, we are also going to train our models with this data. So data that you would typically not see during a squat, so the adjustment of movement, for example, is still labeled as being a squat. So then the model encounters this data and thinks, oh, this is a squat, but then, um, for example, another similar movement pattern occurs in or during a bench press, for example, where a participant adjusts his movement and then the model might think, oh, this is a squat because I've seen this before. So you can already start to imagine like how this could affect our model. Also, that's why it's really important to yeah, really understand the underlying data so you can make better more informed decisions about when to 
remove an outlier and when to leave it in the data set. So that is what we will focus on today. Okay, so now we know what outliers are. Let's look at a few methods that we can use to first determine outliers and then visualize them as well. And we're going to start off with the box plot and the interquartile range. And for that, I'm going to open up this document over here. And here we're looking at a box plot, which can be used to uh, visualize outliers as well as show you some information about the distribution of a data set. And I'm not going to dive into all the technical and statistical details about box plots and distributions. You can look that up if you want to learn more about that. There are also some links over here, but just know that for the first method of determining outliers, we're going to look at box plots and then using the interquartile range, so the IQR, which, have, uh, which has two cutoff points, so a minimum and a maximum, and basically anything that lies outside of this range is considered to be an outlier. So let's start off by creating some box plots to have a look at the data and potential outliers. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to change some style settings again for matplotlib, just like we did in the last episode. But now instead of the Seaborn team, we're going to use the 538 team, which is also a very nice theme in my opinion. So start off with this and then we can continue to the box plots. And now to create a box plot, we can use a method uh, from the pandas library uh, that we can directly call on a data frame. And that is the box plot method. So we can determine a column of a data frame. So let's look at the uh, X acceleration and then say dot box plot. And then when we run this, we get a pretty wide image. And that is because we are using the fixed size over here that is ideal for plotting time series data over time. But for a box plot, it gives um, not so nice image, but we can already see that we have a box plot over here and that anything outside of the uh, line over here and line over here are considered to be outliers. So for this column over here, looking at the total data set, using the IQR method, we can already see that there are some outliers. Now let's make this a bit prettier by also including the label. So now we have the data frame with acceleration X and the label. And then in the box plot, we, we say by, and then we specify the label column. So we're going to split up uh, the data and we basically create a grouped box plot. And then also change the fix size a little to be a little bit taller. So let's check this out. All right, that already looks better. So now we have a, or we have the figure split up based on the label. And we were looking at the acceleration for the X and now we can get a better look at the potential outliers. So here for the squad, we, we see a lot actually. And for the resting period, I think only one. And now we can also switch this up. So for example, say we want to look at the Y acceleration, then we get a different, a different uh, image. So if we compare the overhead press, for example, now we get a lot more potential outliers uh, on the Y axis. And then let's, for example, look at the gyroscope data. And that also gives us a different image. This is a nice starting point to better understand the data. Now, the next step is to uh, add some additional data. So we're not going to only look at uh, a single column, but we're going to look at multiple columns at the same time. So um, coming back to our data over here, what we can do is we can define our outlier columns that we want to look at. So if we have a look at the data over here, basically all the numerical columns should be considered when looking at outliers. For, we're going to um, make a selection from the data frame dot columns. And then we say we want the first six, I believe. Let me check. Yes. So the first six of the columns are all the numerical values. And we're going to store that in a var variable because we are going to use that regularly to loop over. And we're also going to turn that into a list. So when you 
return a uh, data frame columns object, it is uh, considered to be an index and we just wanna turn that into a list. So we get a nice Python list and we store that into the outlier columns. And what we can then do is we can come back here and then put in the outlier columns over here, but then make one more split based on the accelerometer and gyroscope data, like we always do, and then add the label in there as well. So what I'm doing right now is I'm basically wanna make a selection of the data frame and I want to uh, take the columns over here. So this will be the acceleration data and we're going to add the label to that as well. And, oh, sorry, I see that I have a comma over here. And let's have one more look, our list over here. So here we can see that we're using the accelerometer data and we have a label. So just to show that one more time, visually in the data frame, um, what am I missing here? A few extra brackets that we don't need. Okay, so here we can see now we have a selection of the data frame with acceleration and the label. And now we're going to use that to create the box plot group by label. And then the final thing that we're going to add is the layout and that determines how uh, the box plots will be visualized. And for that, we're going to use a layout of one by three. So let's have a look at that. And now we get a better understanding of the data from this one figure only, and we don't have to scroll up and down to compare everything. So we can do the same thing, but then for the gyroscope data, and then we're going to move the three and put it in front of the column. So just to show you that one more time, this will be gyroscope columns plus the label, which will result in the following data frame. And then we're also going to create a plot for that. So let me just clear that up and then run this line after line. So now we have, um, on one screen, two images, a really good understanding of all the individual parameters and also split by the label. And we can already tell by just looking at these uh, figures over here that using the interquantile uh, range, there are potentially a lot of outliers within this data. And let's now look into the data um, a bit deeper and visualize these outliers or potential outliers uh, over time because now everything is just uh, on one big pile and we can't really visually tell whether the outlier, for example, marked over here is actually a really extreme value or that is something that is pretty normal and shouldn't be considered an outlier. So for that, we're going to use a custom function to visualize outliers in time. And I have a really awesome function for you that we're going to use for this. And for this function, I have already put it in the document over here because this is not an episode about data visualization. So we're not going to spend a lot of time creating this whole function because it's quite long. You can go to the document, click on the resources on plotting outliers in time then click over here and here we'll get the preview of the whole function that we're going to use. And you can click here on copy and then you can come back to Visual Studio Code and then we'll paste the function over here. Um, first, let's make sure this is saved and now I will quickly go over what we're doing in this function. So first of all, part of this function comes from this GitHub page over here, which is from the official machine learning for the quantified self book. So this is all open source uh, and we've used some code from this uh, function and later also from uh, another function within this project, uh, but I've adjusted it to better fit my style. But just know that this is the official source. Then briefly covering the function. Okay, so what are we doing? So this is a function that uh, can plot outliers in case of a binary outlier score. So uh, true or false values. And um, we basically insert a data frame and a column and that same column again, but then marked with uh, true false values, whether it is an outlier or not. And then it will create a, a time series plot and it will map or basically plot the non outliers in blue using a, uh, a plus notation. And it will plot values marked as an outlier in red with a plus notation. And this is all just some styling. 
Um, but this is a really awesome function. And now we're going to insert another function and then we're going to take this to action and actually show you how to use this. And that is because before we can actually use this, we first have to mark values as outliers or not using a true false column. And the box plot figure is nice to quickly visualize uh, potential outliers, but it does not um, help us in visualizing or creating a column that marks outliers, um, if you get what I'm saying. So in order to do that, we're going to use another function that is available in the document over here. So let's go back, come back over here and then to marking outliers using IQR. So here's another function that we can copy and then come back to Visual Studio Code. And here it says insert IQR function. We can insert that over here and now we can run this as well. And basically what this will do, so this is necessary before we can visualize them. This will, uh, or takes a data set as an input and also a column specified as a string. And then it will determine the Q1 and the Q3. It will calculate the interquartile range and then it will use um, the notation or the formula over here to calculate the lower bound and the upper bound. And this is also, this was explained in the document. So here you can uh, see what we're basically doing, but this is just the same, but then translated in Python code. And then we're going to add a new column to the data frame. And that column will have the same name of the column that we are evaluating, but then we add underscore outlier to it. So for example, if we're looking at um, acceleration for the Y axis, we will return a data frame, which also has a Y acceleration underscore outlier column, which is marked with true and false values. Um, needless to say, when there is an outlier, it will be marked as true and otherwise it will be marked as false. That is how this function works and it is also a really awesome function and especially when you combine it with this function over here. So now let's see what this looks like when we apply it to a single column and then visualize the results. So let's start off with the acceleration for the X and then save that and then let's say a data set is and then let's call the mark outliers IQR function and insert the data frame and then also the column. So looking at this function over here, we take two inputs, data set and column, looking good. Make sure this is uh, stored in memory, this as well. And then we can check out what we get if we run this function. Let's now have a look at data set. And what we can see is that data set is now just the original data frame. That is this one over here, but we have one extra column. So data frame is 10 columns, data set has 11 columns. And that final column is the acceleration X outlier column. And here you can see false, 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 false. It could be the case that somewhere hidden in this data set of 9,000 rows that there is a true over here. So let's see if that is the case using our plot binary outliers function. And let's have a look what we have to input. So we have a data set, a column, an outlier column, and a reset index, which is optional, uh, sorry, not optional, which is a Boolean, uh, which can be used to yeah, reset the index like we've seen in the previous episode. So it is a time series data frame. And usually when we're plotting the data over here, we want to reset the index first um, to give a better uh, yeah, to better visually represent the data because there are time gaps. So that is why the reset index is in there. So let's uh, have a look and say plot binary outliers. We put in our new data set, which is data set. And then our column is the column. And then our outlier column, column. And then we say plus, and then we do outlier. And then for reset index, uh, let me first set it to false. Then I'll show you why this is important. And I think we're good. Wow, look at that. Okay, first of all, what we can see is that we have uh, non-outlier values in blue and that we have outlier values in red. And you can already see that the values over here look pretty extreme and they're also marked in red here as well. But um, 
like I stated, here we can see that we have a time frame of about two weeks and that is not ideal to visualize this data. So let me turn that to true and then run that again. And now we can already see what's going on at the more granular level. So the function, the mark outliers RQR is definitely doing its job. So we can clearly see that uh, the red dots are only marked at what appears to be pretty extreme values, or at least they're not in the middle. So they're uh, either on, uh, on top or here all the way on the bottom. And just by visually looking at this, we can already tell like, yeah, I could see why, why these are, are outliers. But then over here, it seems like a bit too much, like we would be throwing away a lot of data if we were to accept uh, what we're seeing over here. All right, and let's now continue by creating a loop to loop over all of the outlier columns that we've defined earlier. For a column in outlier columns, we're basically going to do the same thing. So we can copy this over here. And since we've already denoted uh, the column as call in this over here, this should work straight out of the box. And let me clear this up. So what we are now doing for all the outlier columns, we will first run the mark outliers IQR function, the outliers, store it in the data set, and then plot that uh, column, and then do that six times. So let's have a look. All right, first we have the acceleration data, and then we have the gyroscope data. And we can clearly see that the gyroscope data has a lot more red dots, red crosses than the accelerometer data. So we're already starting to see some pretty interesting things over here. So for example, this Z acceleration, I can't, uh, I think there's one, there's one over here, but, but that's it. And then over here in way too extreme. So we would be throwing away a lot of data. So um, this is a good starting point, but we definitely have to tweak some things. And the main problem that we are dealing with right now, and which we are going to solve later, is that we're looking at all the data on basically on one big pile. And we're not differentiating between the different exercises. We can have a look over here and we can clearly see that the data over here is very different from the data over here. And the IQR method is a uh, distribution based method of determining outliers. When the majority of the data looks like this and there are a few uh, sets within the data that look like this, statistically um, looking at the distribution, these are underrepresented, meaning that the uh, yeah the data, or sorry, the the mean value and the st standard deviation is mainly determined by the majority of the data. And values like these uh, are then identified as extreme values because they are larger and don't appear that often in the data set. And um, from looking at the data earlier, I know that the periods over here are periods of rest. And during a period of rest, the participant had no, no limitations of what they could do. So they could walk around, stand up, drink some water. And you can imagine how that results in a movement pattern that is very different from a very limited movement during an exercise. But it is also important for our model that um, it can differentiate between periods of rest and periods of performing an exercise. Then the question arises: okay, so what do we wanna do with this data? And later we will see that it is much better to split the data or group the data by exercise, by label, and then apply this method. That will drastically improve the results. But in order to do that, I'm first going to introduce two different methods, and then we're going to split by exercise and that is basically like the same that we're always doing we're building building block building block building block and then we bring everything together with that out of the, out of the way let's continue to chauvinet's criterion so chauvinet's criterion is also a distribution based method to look at outliers but it tackles it a di bit different than the iqr method so coming back to the document we can have a look at chauvinet's criterion and the chauvinet's criterion is a bit more complex in terms of um 
how it is actually calculated. So I won't really dive into that, but know that there is some extra information over here and that um, this is from uh, the original book, Machine Learning for the Quantified Self, but you can also just look up Chauvinet's criterion. Um, but basically to, to sum it up, according to Chauvinet's criterion, we reject a measurement meaning that we identify it as an outlier from a data set of size n. So that is just the length of the data set when its probability of observing is less than uh, one divided by two times n. And then n is the length of the data set. And then a generalization is to replace the value two with the parameter c. And that is also what we will see in the also awesome function that we have over here and that we're going to use. So we're going to basically take a data set again, then a column, and then we uh, take this value C that we default to two, and then it will calculate Chauvinet's criterion for us. And like I said, the calculation to calculate the probability of an observation is pretty complex and we won't really go into that, uh, but that is basically what we're doing here. And we're using the SciPy library for that. And this as well comes from GitHub repository over here, where you can have a look at the outlier detection. So there are a few different methods in here as well, but here you can see Chauvinet. So this is the calculations uh, that we were using. So I also didn't came up with this. So just so you know that now coming back to the function, same step as before we copy the function and then we have a uh, function over here or a, a comment over here that says insert Chauvinet's function. And we place that over here. And then one more thing to note coming back to Chauvinet's criterion as well, is that it assumes a normal distribution of the data. So that is really important. Otherwise the uh, results uh, can be messed up or wrong. So the, uh, we assume that the data is normally distributed and there are plenty of ways to check whether a data is normally distributed, but the most straightforward ways are to look at the histogram or a box plot. And then for histogram, the question is, do we see a bell shaped curve? And for a box plot, uh, the question is, is the box symmetrical, meaning that uh, the whiskers at the end um, have somewhat of the same length compared to the center box for Q3 and Q1. So let's have a quick, quick check at our data again to see whether it is actually normally distributed. And in order to create histograms, I'm going to scroll up a little bit and then take the code where we created the box plot, then come down to over here. So Chauvinet's criterion check for normal distribution insert uh, this again and then we're going to replace box plot with plot.hist and now we're going to make the fix size a little larger and we're going to do a three by three and you will see in a bit why is the case so again box plot plot hist and then again all right so let's oh where are we going let's have a look at the accelerometer data awesome so we're creating a grouped box plot grouped by label for uh, acceleration X, Y, and Z. And we're also um, yeah, creating separate plots for all the labels. So looking at this, coming back to explanation or our check, better to say, do we see a bell shaped curve? That is basically the check. And then in general, I would say I see bell shaped curves for most of the data. There is some data especially the, the rest data over here, which is especially the Y acceleration. This is far from normally distributed. So that could um, result in problems when looking at the resting data. But other than that, it looks kind of normal to me. Let's have a look at the gyroscope data. Oh, this is even more normally distributed. So yeah, we're just looking at the bell shaped curve. Um, it's not perfect, but for the case uh, of this demonstration, we will just assume that the data or at least most of the data is normally distributed and we can continue to use Chauvinet's criterion for outlier detection. So from a high overview, this function works exactly the same as the mark outliers IQR function in terms of what the output of the function is, namely a data set with an additional column marked as outlier. But the calculation is a bit more complex in here. And as I said, we won't cover this part, but for now we can 
make sure this function is uh, stored within memory. And what we can now do is we can take this uh, part of code over here that we've used to loop over all the columns using the mark uh, outliers IQR method. And what we can now do is we can just change it into shovelnet. And that is the nice uh, that is nice about these functions that they are standardized to result in the same output um, because now we can just let me clear that up and look at the shovelnet's criterion for determining outliers. And we can already tell there are a lot less outliers, which um, is good in my opinion, because uh, as I just mentioned, looking at the IQR method, there was a lot of data, especially also here in the, in the beginning, that was marked red. So I remember the, for, for example, the gyroscope Z data, this was all marked as outliers. And now we can see that um, it's not so hard on the data anymore, as in it is uh, it's leaving a lot more um, values untouched. We can see problems here during the uh, in the rest data, but that could also be the case because we've just seen that the resting data is actually not normally distributed. And that's why it's resulting in a lot of outliers here as well. So very interesting results. All right, let's now continue to the local outlier factor function. And as I've mentioned, we first want to create all the different functions and then actually start comparing them to check what is the best approach. So we're quickly jumping over this part uh, without really going into the details, but uh, that's to bring it all uh, together later in this video when we have all the results. So local outlier factor. We can come back to our document and there is another awesome function over here. Um, that we can use to calculate outliers based on the local outlier factor. This one is a bit different than the previous ones because it is a distance-based uh, approach to determining outliers in, uh, versus a distribution-based approach. And it's also an uh, unsupervised uh, learning method because we're basically going to train a model and then make predictions. And we're going to use those predictions um, to mark outliers or not. So um, again, I'm not going to cover all the details. You can look at the scikit-learn library over here to better check out how this works and how the calculated uh, values are calculated. But it's basically, um, yeah, looking at the local density deviation, giving a data point with respect to its neighbors. And another key difference over here is that before we were looking at individual columns, now we're going to look at an individual row. So we are going to consider the six data points within a row and use that to compare it to all of its neighbors or uh, the neighbors that we number of neighbors that we specify. And we're going to go with the recommendation of the scikit-learn library of setting the total amount of neighbors to 20. For each of the rows that we ha have in our data frame, six uh, columns, we're going to look at the 20 closest neighbors and then check whether values are isolated. So again, function, insert LOF function over here, make sure to run this as well. And the only difference over here is that we don't have to loop over all the individual columns because we're just going to uh, import the whole data set or take the whole data set as an input. And then as you can see, what happens over here is uh, like in the regular way you use scikit-learn uh, classifiers is we define an object from, uh, from the classifier and then we define the data set. And that is in this case our data set and then specified with the columns which are all of our outlier columns in this case. So not looping over in one by one. And then we're going to do a fit predict on data itself. And then we also compute the uh, negative outlier factor scores, which we are not even using in this example over here. We're just going to check whether um, data set outlier LOF column, um, we're going to set that to either true or false based on whether the outliers that we fit predict over here are set to negative one. So negative one is an outlier and one is not an outlier. And this will result in the same true false column that we've seen earlier. So that is how this works. So in order to create this loop, we have to make one small adjustment. So if I take the previous loop that we've created. I'm just gonna take this over here and 
we are starting with the for loop during the data visualization part. So we can um, visualize the outlier columns in the same manner that we've done over here. So that is by a loop, but we're going to uh, mark the outliers using the mark outliers LOF, uh, not in a for loop, but just uh, putting in the whole data frame and then this should be the outlier columns. So the outlier columns and the data frame and that is what we throw into the function over here. Then let's have a look at it and then we get a data set. Um, let's check. Ah, I see one small mistake here. So um, we are returning the data set, the outliers and the X score. So that is what we're seeing over here. And we also have to specify that over here in the output. So we're not really doing anything with that, but we're just going to store them. Let me just run this one more time. Now we have a data set with one column outlier lof. So that considers all of the uh, uh, six rows, sorry, all of the six columns for every row in the data frame. And then you can also see like uh, how this is just a list of ones and minus ones. And that's how we uh, basically specify the outlier loft column over here and turn it into a Boolean. So we say where outliers equals minus one, that would be true, otherwise false. And then we also get the X scores, which you can basically see as the certainty of whether it is an outlier or not. And we're using the, uh, in this case, we're using the negative outlier factor. So uh, the more negative a value is, the less chance of it to be an outlier. So if that makes sense. So we're not really using it. You can also look that up in the documentation of the scikit-learn library. There they explain how they use it. They basically use it to create these circles around here where the larger the circle, the more certain the model is that it is an outlier. And it uses that value for it. All right, so now we have the data set and we can loop over the columns again. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, I see we've made a tiny mistake and that is because I haven't adjusted this over here. And that is correct because now we're looking at the outlier, what was it called, outlier LOF. That is our column that we're considering right now. That should result, yeah, yeah, let's check. So that was the error before. Okay, interesting. So. What we can see right now is we're looking at all the individual columns and we can see that now outliers are starting to be identified more within the data itself. So before it was usually we could basically draw a straight line and anything underneath that would be marked as an outlier uh, or on the top everything above a certain line would be marked as an outlier. But now we're starting to see data points within what seems to be a regular uh, movement pattern uh, is marked as an outlier. Also, what's very interesting over here is that you can see that these values here on the bottom are, are fine. But then in between uh, the, the methods that we're using right now, things that these are outliers. And from, um, from how we can look at this is here we can really see the difference between distribution and distance based uh, methods. So you can see that this point over here is really isolated. And when it looks at its 20 next neighbors, the local outlier factor model think this is a very isolated data point. But if we compare that to a distribution based method where you look at the data as a whole, then it says, oh, this value is basically on this line over here. And there's a lot of data around that point. So this value is fine. This is an extreme value. But then with the local outlier factor, it says, no, I have a cluster of data over here. I have a, a couple of points. And this point is, is not that strange because it's surrounded by uh, 20 or so neighbors that are nearby. So really interesting, two very different approaches to look at outliers. And now it is up to us as data scientists to determine what the best methods or what the best approach is in this case for this particular problem. Okay, so next step, check outliers grouped by the label. So I've identified this earlier. It's probably better in this scenario to first split the data and then check it out. So uh, yeah, I think that's a more fair assessment of the data. So let's have a look at how to do that. And I'm going to uh, quickly copy a block of code because this is basically uh, all stuff that we've already done. So 
we're going to look at the different methods. So first the mark outliers IQR, and we're going to look at the bench. So you can just uh, copy this uh, over here, just type it on your own and start with a label bench. And then we create a for loop, four column in the outlier columns. And then we're going to basically uh, do the same as we've did before, but now instead of, so uh, please note that the difference is that we're not putting in the whole data frame, but we're putting in the data frame with a selection on the label. So in this case, we've just specified label is bench press. So if I check this out, this results in a data frame with only bench press data. And now if we run this with the IQR method, we can see that the patterns are uh, much more similar because this is all bench press data. And now the also the whole distribution of the underlying data changed. And now what we can also see is that the IQR uh, method seems even um, harder in marking, or uh, I would say it is even stricter in whether it is an outlier or not. So it's marking a lot of points over here, even clusters of, of data as, as outliers. And we can basically uh, draw some straight lines over here that anything above or below a certain line is marked as an outlier. Have a look at squat, for example. Oh, uh, let's have a look at the squat. Okay, also some areas where uh, there are lots of outliers. So still, in my opinion, this is a bit strict and we would be throwing away a lot of data using this method. Let's uh, apply the same approach, but now to the mark outliers and then to the bench press. Okay, what are we looking at here? And here we can see that Chauvinet is uh, treating the bench press data very nicely. So we can only see a couple of outliers over here. And this seems fairly reasonable to me, especially look, look at this over here. We got a nice blue area over here and we have one weird point over here, which in my opinion could definitely be an outlier. So um, here we have a few more, but again, by looking at the whole data set uh, over here, these are some pretty weird looking points over here. So I, um, I like the Chauvinet approach here. We can also just visually inspect the squat one more time. Again, I like I like the results over here. So few points, not too strict, looking good. Now let's have a final look at the local outlier factor. And then let's just take this. Yeah, let's, let's run this. Okay, local outlier factor. Again, we see this behavior where we are mar now marking points in the, the within the bulk of the data and not necessarily above or below a certain point. Very interesting results. Okay, on to the next part and almost the, the final part of this video already. And that is choose a method and deal with the outlier. So as of right now, we have visually inspected all of the outliers using the plots over here. But if I look at my data frame, this is still the same data frame that I've imported over here. So now we have to make a decision. First, what approach do we want to use? And second, what do we want to do with outliers? Do we want to remove them? Do we want to mark them? Do, do we want to impute them? So let's focus on that right now. So in order to do this, we're going to first test on a single column. So like usual, we're st we start with the building blocks. So let's, for example, say the column is gyroscope Y. And now let's look at uh, a data set or create a data set where we say uh, mark outliers and we'll take the chauvinet in this case and we insert our data frame and we have to input our column as well, which is our column. And let's check. So our column over here and then let's run that and let's check it out like this. So now we have our data set, which has an additional column for gyroscope C outlier. Now the next step is to translate what we're seeing here. So this Boolean column over here to a actual transformation in the column over here. So let's first have a look at data set where we say data set and then we can just take this new column that we've created. Remember with pandas we can do uh, Boolean indexing. So let me put that in quotes. So basically what we can do over here is this is a Boolean series. So 
false and there are some truths somewhere in here. We can uh, insert this between square brackets giving a data frame and it will do a Boolean indexing and it will, will return only the values where this is true. So by running this, we can see where all the outliers are. And we have, a, we have a couple. So we can see all of the values over here are marked as true. So that is the first step. So now we know, okay, this is, uh, sorry, these are all of the values that we want to adjust. What we're going to use right now is we're going to replace these values with NAN. And we're going to later take care of these missing values. But for now, we're just going to remove these values from the data frame. We're not gonna move the entire row. We're just gonna set the values over here to NP NAN. And in order to do this, we're going to take the data set and we're going to take the location and then we're going to specify the column over here and we're going to set those values to NP NAN. This is a pretty advanced, but we're basically using the uh, log function of the data frame to first make a selection based on the Boolean indexing. And then we're going to say, we want to set where this is true. We want to set the values of this column to np.nan. So when we run this, we, will, we don't get an output. So this happens in place. So note that we don't have to do data set is. This updates the data frame in place. And now if we look this again, we can see that all the values, gyroscope Z outlier was set to true, so marked as an outlier, is now set to none. And now if you have a look at the data set, that just contains uh, still all of the 9000. Still has that column, but somewhere in here where this is set to true, this value is now set to none. We can check that by running this. So that was the first piece of this puzzle, testing this on a single column. But now we want to create a for loop as usual and loop over all of the outlier columns and perform this transformation in a loop. And in order to do this, I'm going to first create a copy of the original data frame that we call outliers removed DF. So let's check this out. Original data frame. So that is just the same as we've imported up here. Nothing's changed. And we're going to create a copy now, meaning that outliers removed DF is exactly the same. And we're going to do this to yeah, create a new final version of the data frame that we will export later. And now we're going to create a for loop just as usual to loop over the data. So we're going to say for column in outlier columns. So remember the outlier columns are just the six columns over here and we're going to loop over them one by one. And we're going to say for label in they have label.unique. And that basically means that we're going to loop over all the individual um, labels that are in the data frame. So we're going to apply the approach where we first group the data, as we've seen that that results in a overall more fair assessment of whether a value is an outlier, especially in the distribution based uh, models. So we're going to loop over the columns and then the labels. So it's a nested for loop. Now, the next step is to actually label the outliers based on what we've uh, done here already. So let me just copy this line over here from the Chauvinet's criterion. And we just go to the next line and we say, okay, data set mark outlier Chauvinet's. And then here we enter the data frame and we filter by label. Then next thing we're going to basically do what we've done here. So we're going to actually set the values to mp.nan, but now we're going to make this adjustable for the for loop by replacing the uh, values. So that would be data set outlier. Yeah. So basically we're first making, uh, so we're first selecting the column that has the true false values. So the Boolean series and then we're going to use that to make a selection and then update the column within the for loop and set it to np nan so to add some comments over here we replace value marked as outliers with nan and now the next step that we have to do is um, an additional step that we haven't seen before because now we're storing everything in the variable data set and the variable data set is a subset is a selection based on the label but eventually we of course want to update these values as well in the outlier removed data frame. So we're going to update the column in the original 
data frame. So in order to do this, we want to take the outlier remove data frame and we're going to use the lock notation again, where we say we want, uh, we want to create a subset where outliers remove, they have label equals the label that we are using in the for loop. So basically what we're saying right here is we're first creating a subset based on the label. So on the loop where we have a bench press, we say, okay, where uh, the subset labels is bench press, that is the selection. And then we'll use the same notation to update the values within that column. And we say, okay, this is the column that we want to uh, change. So the column within the for loop as well. And we want to set that to data set and then the column that we've just updated. This is a pretty advanced mechanism, but uh, I'm not sure if there is a more straightforward way to do this. So to summarize, we first create a subset of the original data frame based on the value of the for loop. Then we're going to mark the outliers using Chauvinet's criterion as usual. But that results in a data set that is a subset of the original data frame. So when we override the values, we still don't override them in our target output data frame. So then the next step is we take a subset of our output data frame and we specify the column that we've just defined over here in the loop. And please let me know in the comments if you think there's a better or more straightforward way to do this, because I feel like there is a, a better way to do this, but not sure. Anyways, let's continue. Um, we update the data frame. And now the final cool thing that we can do is we can basically uh, create a print statement that also lets us know how many values are removed. So uh, we can, for example, say n outliers equals, and then we take the length of the original data frame, and then we subtract the length of the outliers, uh, oh, sorry, outliers removed DF, and then we take the subset column, and then we say drop NA. So what we're doing here is remember when there is an outlier, we replace it with np.nan, which means there is a missing value. And then by dropping all those missing values, we get a data frame that is less than 9,900 records. And by subtracting that from the length from the original data frame, uh, know how many outliers are in that uh, certain um, or in that specific column for that specific exercise. Now, all we have to do is create a print statement where we say uh, quotes and then we create an F string and then we say removed outliers, and then we say column, and then we say four, and then we say label. So removed X outliers from acceleration Y for bench press. And that should do the job. So now let me see, let me clear this up, check our inputs again. We have our data frame, original data frame, nothing's changed. We create a copy, store it in outliers removed AF, let me clear it up, run the for loop, loop over everything and replace the outliers with missing values. What we got, removed zero from acceleration X for bench. Awesome. So looks like this is working and we can see that especially for the gyroscope Z data over here, we get a lot of values that are removed and we can do a quick check um, using shuffle nets again. So this is for the squat. So Let's say, for example, we, we take a, a deadlift because we can see that for a deadlift, there are 40 outliers removed in the gyroscope C. So let's store a label like this and then let's have a look. Ah, I see one mistake uh, when calculating the length we were using the, uh, I was initially using the data frame and the outliers removed, but that is wrong. We have to use the data set here. And that's also why you were seeing these values uh, increase over time because it was looking at how many values were removed from the data set already. So um, that we should have, uh, we could have seen that earlier by looking at these, these values over here and seeing that they were increasing. Um, it should be data set and data set. That is how we calculate the values. And now let's run that again. Now we get a different picture over here. So we can see zero, two, couple of values, couple of values. And then for the gyroscope for the, the, the 
gyroscope Z data for the deadlift. If we run that again, so deadlift, Chauvinet, let's go. Is this the deadlift? This doesn't look like the deadlift. Make sure this is the deadlift and then run that one more time. Yes, now we're looking at the deadlift data again. We can see that we have one, two, three, four, five. And if you count all of them, they are 14. So we have 14 red dots. That is looking good. And now if we take our outliers they have removed let me clear this up we can see that this is a uh, data set same length as the original data frame also same amount of columns but now if we do info we can see that some columns have missing values meaning that we have successfully replaced values marked as an outlier using the chauvinets criterion with mp.nan and that brings us to the final line of code that we have to write for this video today. And that is we take the data frame and we're going to export that. So we say two, and just like usual, we go into the data folder interim. And now we're going to call this O2 outliers removed. And then we call this show for nets dot P K L. Let's run this. Let's validate that in the data interim uh, folder. We have that over here and now we're done. So we now have a data frame that we can continue working on in the next series. And then we're going to add additional features. It will be very interesting. And we're also going to tackle how to deal with these missing values. So we have covered a lot in this episode and as of right now, you saw me using Chauvinet's criterion. And from looking at the data, in my opinion, Chauvinet's criterion looked the most fair, the best approach for dealing with outliers on this data. But to be honest, I'm not sure. I can't really tell from looking at this. And tests that we eventually have to perform is, will it improve model results. We have now exported this data frame as O2 outliers removed chauvinets. In later series, we will look at different approaches of removing outliers, generating features, imputing missing values, and then check what the effect is on the overall performance of the classification model. So we will look at accuracy, for example, precision, recall, and we will validate which approach is the best. Because as I said, to be honest, you don't know for sure. You don't know what the impact is of removing the values that we've just identified as outliers. Removing outliers is always an interesting part of a data science project like any part. Uh, it requires some special attention and domain knowledge from a data scientist to really validate whether an approach is correct or not. And that brings us to the end of this episode. So we've covered everything. There's resources over here that you can find additional information. I want to thank you guys for watching. If you have made it all the way to the end, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. I put a lot of time and effort into making these videos for you and by liking and subscribing you really help me out and help the channel to grow and also let YouTube know that you want to see more content like this. So it's, it's basically a win-win. It's very good. So thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next week in part five where we dive into feature engineering.